According to my clock, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host, and I'm your cat herder for the next hour. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our hour of conversation. We have a couple of fantastic guests, and I'm really looking forward to meeting them and introducing them to you. I'm just absolutely delighted to welcome these two people. They have authored right now a new book that is in the publisher, and we should be able to buy it pretty soon. They'll tell us all about it, which gives us a bracing look at how we can reimagine higher education. Uh, these are both wonderful professors at the City University of New York, which is an extraordinary institution by itself. And I have a lot I want to ask them. I have a lot of questions I want to ask them. And I want to hear more from what they're working on right now. So let me just start by bringing Christina up on stage. Hello, Christina. Hi, how are you? Great. Good to see you. How is everything? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Oh, it's our pleasure. And just, just so you know, there's a danger between me hosting and you being a guest. And the danger is that I will ask you about climate change in the humanities, and I will totally, totally go off in a completely different direction. So I've got to hold back from that. Got to hold okay. back from that. But I want to ask you, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects and the big ideas that are occupying you? Thanks so much for asking this book with Kathy. Um, we are working on a book called um, Transform Every Classroom. Um, it's a practical guide for transformative teaching and learning where it's about getting students to participate, to be active agents in the classroom um, and to give students agency, really. Oh, oh fantastic. And this is from uh, Harvard University Press? Yes. Anticipated for next year. Very good. Very good. Well, it's a great project, and I appreciate the glimpse into it right now. Um, and what are you going to be teaching? Or are you um, going to be teaching? So I'm, I'm actually not teaching this year. I'm working as the executive director and postdoctoral fellow at the Transformative Learning in the Humanities program. It's a three-year initiative at CUNY. Um, we just um, are now concluding our first planning year. We just welcomed 51 faculty fellows from all across CUNY's 25 campuses. Wow. Um, and this is supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And it's again about participatory active learning, structuring mm -hmm. equity into the classroom, mm -hmm. um, which I know Kathy will also want to talk about today. Um, and so, yeah, it's a very exciting program. We just did over 70 workshops, faculty organized them themselves. Um, we had 90 faculty participate and they, they worked with their students. Students participated, they gave their input on active learning methods, um, they gave their input on ungrading and it was really a transformative experience. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So on the one hand, you've got equity um, and on the other hand, you've got student democracy, student empowerment student agency that's terrific what a great well, project any change in higher ed needs to come from those who are invested in it most in students and faculty so um and as now in this um alt -ac role um you know administering this program i have the wonderful opportunity to learn from so many um inspiring educators and and their students as well oh what a privilege what a great position what a great program um, well, Christina, I want to hear more about that, but I want to get your colleague on the stage next to you. Um, and so let me bring on Kathy Davidson, who was one of our shining guests just a couple of years ago in the before times. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Hi, Christina. <laughs> Haven't seen you in ages, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, we put on a big five hour, four or five hour institute for all of our new faculty fellows. It was pretty amazing because everything oh. we did was brainstorming, hackathons, creating manifestos together, all of the active learning things that we're preaching in our in our book. So practicing and preaching active learning. This is great. This is great. Absolutely. The, the book we're doing together, and I'm so lucky to be working with Christina. The last thing in the world I wanted to be was one of those old fout academics that tells young people how to do what young people already know how to do. Uh, Christina has been teaching for a decade, a relatively new PhD, but she's also dealt with the realities of teaching in this world. 
and uh, teaching as an adjunct at many different kinds of institutions. And that's really crucial because what we're trying to do is take all of the radical theory we've all read about in Friere and Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde, but translate it into really practical things that don't take more time, but are more effective ways of learning and more um, egalitarian ways of learning. And we've got all the research on that, a thousand studies of yeah. active learning. Yes, indeed. Well, this is, that, and that was just yesterday. That now, was yesterday, yes. Now, <laughs> We're Ka moving on. <laughs> uh, now, Kathy, one, one, I'm, I'm assuming that there, there's a few people here who might not know you. Um, and I, so I just wanted, just to get to introduce you, let me ask, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? You well, got this great book and what we else? have this book and I'm also finishing, I hope, um, a science fiction novel. Um, I just feel, well, felt like, I know, yes, I know. Yes. I've never, I've never written science fiction before. And until three years ago, when I started this, I hadn't really read it except for Octavia Butler. And now it's all I do. And I think it's because we live in a world where, where science and fiction, neither one of them is capable of dressing the world. So we need to put them together. And uh, it's, uh, I'm having a blast. I'm just having a great time. Oh, that's fantastic. I remember I'm also looking. doing a new edition of The New Education. I should mention that because that would be a little remiss not to mention it. But. Now, is that a second edition? It is. A, it's a whole new paperback edition with a new foreword. Um, the original had 10 tips for students to do well in college, 10 tips for faculty to change their classroom. This has 10 tips for changing your institution and a number of other features. Well, and it'll be in paperback, which is cool. Oh, that's great. Let us know when it goes out so I can Will start do. Will do. Oh, that's fantastic. And and friends, if you, uh, in the announcement for this program, we shared a bunch of links. Uh, Kathy has a stack of great books to her name, um, and I really recommend all of them. And Christina has been building up an empire on the web with a whole range of great content, especially from um, Margaret Fuller, as well as, as mentioned before, uh, teaching the humanities and climate change. So please keep an, keep an eye on all of this work. Um, now, the forum is all about questions from everybody, everybody in the audience. I just want to set that up um, by asking. We just lived through an extraordinary and very weird time, uh, and it's not quite done, but we seem to be winding down the pandemic in the United States. And among other things, it showed us that higher education actually had a tremendous reservoir uh, of innovation. I mean, a year and a quarter ago, we were able to flip higher education online in just a few weeks, in fact, just a few days in some cases. Um, what does that tell you, too, about higher education's ability to reimagine the classroom and learning? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, and then, Christina, you can sure. flesh this out. What I love is that two years ago, if you'd asked anybody if higher education could change, they would say that education hadn't changed since Socrates walked in the you know, forum, you know, thousands of years ago, which is completely wrong. It's a fal false history. H higher education went through a tremendous change in the 19th century when the modern university was invented. Yeah. But in two weeks, 18 million students were put online. And um, when I've given talks and polled the audience, we changed grading methods. We changed semesters. We changed, oh, my God, the Carnegie Credit Hour. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, if we could change the Carnegie Credit Hour in emergency, we should be able to change the tyranny of meritocracy. Um, all the whole ways of gaming the system that go into admissions, scholarships, uh, the funding of K-12 through education. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you saw this week, someone put up, uh, did some wonderful research on math scores and put up a map of income distribution in the United States with little points of who makes the most or the least income. And then... A second map of map scores are the same map, right? We're not majoring. We're not. We're not teaching math. We're teaching economics, meaning how rich your parents are. Um, but I think wow. if we can make the kind of changes we did in two weeks last year, we can do anything. And we have to remember that we had that ability and remember our own resources as being able to respond to a crisis when lives depended on it, and put that same energy in a major educational re re reboot and and change. Um, just to add to that, because I've had the tremendous honor of working with Kathy closely, um, particularly at this stage of my career, to work with someone who has so much experience and so much of the the learning science knowledge, the social justice knowledge, the exposure. And we were talking yesterday um, 
I little did I know I learned yesterday that you had actually met some of the great educators, progressive educators at CUNY. You said you roomated with June Jordan at one point, you knew Audrey Lord, both it's quite amazing to kind of have the experience of working with you and learning these things. And I think, you know, I taught, I taught last year um, online and I and in response to your question, um, I really think that the most successful work in the classroom happened in collaboration with students. Um, and it felt like we had been doing research for this book for many years and the world became more aware of the things that we had learned, that I had learned. Kathy knew all of this beforehand, but um, the things that I learned about students' lives, about the majority mm -hmm. of students who work yes. full time or part time jobs, who are the primary breadwinners in their families, who have children, who have so many obligations in addition to being students, that we were all basically invited into their home lives mm -hmm. um, in a very um, invasive way um, and i think those who were able to really engage their students in a two-way dialogue um were really successful in modifying their classrooms their virtual classrooms to meet students where they are and to create community online to reach out to those students who didn't have bandwidth and try to find ways to support them and you know, it also showed how much support educators need um, and that more time and more resources are so important to give students the support they need to foster um, what Bell Hooks calls deep and meaningful learning, mm -hmm. um, that that's, that's so important. Community is so important to learning. So that's yeah. what I think that has shown us all. And the science, the learning science, the research, it all supported that. But now it feels like the whole world is in on the secret. <laughs> Indeed, it should be, or should be. Um, the uh, the sounds of sirens for me is always proof that we're talking in New York City. Um, so that's Sorry it. about that. No problem, no problem. I'm a native New Yorker, I, I know the sound well. It's nostalgia. Um, but uh, Ooh, it, th oh, these, this is good. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, well, uh, well, thank you. This, this is these are these are great great ways of, of moving forward uh, from the experience of the pandemic, not moving back to 2019, but discovering how we can change in a lot of ways. Uh, and of course, you're both at the CUNY system, which has you know one of the diverse, most diverse, and one of the most um, economically suffering populations uh, in higher education in the U.S. Now. Uh, I have a bunch of other questions, but I'd much rather hear from everybody else. And already we have a whole stack of questions coming in. And we have one from a near neighbor of yours uh, at Hofstra University, uh, Professor um, Benjamin uh, Rifkin. And he asks, please talk about what we can do now to prepare for the reconvenient campuses in the fall with regard to the very differentiated experience of trauma in the past two years. I'm, I'm going to put that up on the screen again. That's a really, really subtle question. I'm not sure you can all see that. So, you know, looking ahead for uh, the fall, how can we prepare for the differentiated experience of trauma? Um, I, I think even just preparing for trauma, um, preparing, you know, I was talking with a colleague the other day and she was holding herself to this standard of teaching to pretend, like as if it were pre-pandemic. And I was like, hold on. <laughs> We have a lot of mourning to do, um, and you know some of us haven't seen loved ones lost, and it, it feels like the losses keep coming. And I think we need to embrace ourselves, or you know, embrace self care um, and care in the classroom, and continue to prioritize that. Um, that we brought a degree of care into our classrooms and to recognize that, okay, things are getting better, but now is a time also to mourn, to grieve, to process, to look forward and to reimagine, um, you know, it's almost speculative fiction now, what will come. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Kathy, I'm sure has more. Yeah, no, I agree with that as well. And I think um, just asking that question uh, is extremely meaningful 
Mm. Um, remembering that the issue isn't just, oh, what technology we use, but like, what are, who are we as humans and who are our students as humans? And what have they been through? Um, what has our society been through? I mean, I just saw on Twitter today that more people are leaving their jobs uh, because they don't like their jobs. Uh -huh. um, and without notice, just leaving with no plans for the future than ever before. The flip side of that is women who suddenly during the pandemic became realized uh, without paid child caregivers, that they were um, responsible for families in a way that they thought their egalitarian ma marriages um, uh -huh. obviated and who, who, whose work le force level is down to the 1980s level uh -huh. are now trying to figure out how to re-enter the, market, the, the uh, job market. Uh -huh. So we're talking about these are our kids, these are the parents of our students, and these are our students ourselves. So many, 25% of students are over 27. Those uh -huh. are our students. So on every level, there's been disruption. And how we think about that in terms of how we structure our classes, I think, is, is the mo single most important thing we can do. And um, I think a lot of us are going to be teaching hybrid in the fall. Uh -huh. um, I don't know that we know how to do that very well. I think I'm a darn good face-to-face -face teacher. I think I'm a darn good online teacher. I'm not sure if I'm good at an under-resourced university like um, uh, CUNY, where I'm going to have basically have a cell phone photographing me as I lecture to students. I haven't lectured even to hundreds and hundreds of students I don't lecture. Suddenly I'm in a situation where the technology is making me teach in a way that could be bad for both my face-to-face -face and my online students. Um, we have to figure a lot out yeah. uh, for, on every level. And I agree with Christina, we have to give ourselves some breaks. We're not going to do it perfectly. And admitting we... Uh, did Kathy just freeze up? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, well, if Ka here, I'm going to um, uh, give her a chance to uh, to reload the screen. Sure. Um, and so, Kathy, if you can hear this, just just hit uh, hit reload. In the in the chat, you had uh, at least one echo. Uh, Brittany Hofstadter said that she's seen very few darn good hybrid teachers, uh, which is, I think, the case. Um, and I just if. I, I want to thank you both, Christina and uh, Kathy, for very, very rich answers to that to that really solid question. Uh, you can go back into the forum archives of the past year, where we've had a bunch of sessions, uh, including two on high flex pedagogy with uh, Brian Beatty, uh, the inventor of the term. We've had several on uh, academic work, self care, balancing work and life in the case of the pandemic, uh, and above all, this kind of intentional pedagogy of listening hard. Uh, to our students uh, to see what they experienced and where they are uh, right now, I think is crucial. Um, and so uh, thank you again um, uh, for a really, really good question. Kathy, are you back? Okay. She, I think you're back, but you seem to be having a problem with uh, sound quality, with uh, the feed. You're stuttering a bit. Uh, why don't you just try reloading this page and see how that changes things? Uh, ben, th thank you for the really good question. Um, that was a really solid question. If you're new to the Future Transform, by the way, Ben's question is a great example of, of, a, of a text question. It works just that easily. Uh, and we have a few other folks that are up here right now. I want to make sure that we can see their questions too. So from Kate Montgomery uh, at, uh, at SMU, as humanists and interdisciplinarians, and amidst the constant debates of the value relevance of liberal arts education, how do you see humanities education reimagined and more valued in society? That's such uh, an question. excellent question. Um, so one thing that um, actually connects these two questions, um, I think, is talking about soft skills and focusing our teaching on what is most essential for students to learn. Um, and what I think is so important is pointing out to students not just what we are learning or what is in the prescripted curriculum, if it's a uniform curriculum, um, or what you have chosen or what you're asking them to choose if you're asking students to design the syllabus themselves, um, that we point out how and why we are learning is so important and you know i often call this lifting up the curtains to show students mm. the string um mm. of how mm. and why it works right so no. let's take a simple group activity okay when students are upset that you know one group member just it's just not working it's not going right well 
I say, okay, this is one semester. If this is a job, if you wanted to change groups, you would need to either change departments or get a new job. And that's much harder. So yeah. now is a perfect time to practice working through that difficulty and communicating and trying to find a way to make it work. And, you know, I don't just throw students in without mentoring them. So thinking about group office hours where I can also talk about how to work through problems as a group, how to raise issues in a way that, um, again, like doesn't put unnecessary burden or labor on students. I'm still the one you know, the, the supervisor, you know, I would never put students in the role of supervisor, that's not their responsibility, but no, no. to mentor students and how effective group work is done and how to work collaboratively across differences. Um, I think that is a way to emphasize the soft skills, the essential skills that employers are looking for. And, you know, for example, one interview question that's very common is tell us about a time that something wasn't working and how did you overcome it? You know, that is a common question and you need communication, collaboration, um, resiliency, independent research, you know, things like that. Those skills are really important. I think if we just point those out or show students, here's what you could put on your resume or, you know, you wrote this paper why don't you submit this abstract to a conference or to an essay contest, put that on your resume? You know, things like that, that we can talk through. Um, Kathy's not on stage right now, but I know that she's worked with students on how to write a good cover letter. Um, I've done something similar with my students, you know, and Steve Berg, wonderful educator, so much admiration for him. He teaches students how to write a professional email. So uh, thank you. Uh, just okay. explaining how and why is really important. That's very smart. A whole set of humanities uh, humanity skills. Let me see if, uh, if we've got Kathy's bandwidth set up. There you are. <laughs> I guess those um, sirens were for a reason. It seems like the whole internet went down in this part of the world. Oh, they no. were coming for your bandwidth. <laughs> they took it, but then they went away. Um, I wasn't prepared for Christina to go on. She could do a fine job without me, but I'm uh, happy to be back. Talked okay. about soft and essential skills. Oh. And and in fact, just just before you uh, uh, cut loose, Kathy, uh, in in the chat, um, Benjamin Rifkin had a couple of quick responses. One was he said, "I would like us to move away from the term soft skills to core skills, um, because I think that's that we want to elevate this." And also celebrated your celebration of collaboration skills as being key, uh, which thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, so I like I like calling them core or essential skills. Essential yeah. skills. When I used to teach um, business managers. They said, those aren't soft skills, those are essential skills. So we started uh -huh. naming them essential uh -huh. skills. Oh, very good, very good. So the humanities, uh, how can how can we elevate the humanities and bring the humanities back, Kathy? I don't think there's any, first of all, I, I'm a little nervous about the term the humanities or the term the sciences. I think knowledge is way too interconnected and that one of the problems of the modern university is that in the 1890s, we, cr we created these silos that made things distinct that in real life aren't. And that's another thing we learned from the pandemic. The pandemic was every bit as much about economic disaster and economic inequality as it was about a disease. Um, the fact that between January and now we have this incredible vaccine rate in the United States and such a very low transmission rate of a vaccine is not a healthcare issue. My relatives in Canada still haven't had their vaccines. Uh -huh. It's a policy uh -huh. issue. It's a business issue. It's a philosophy issue. It's a governmental issue. It's a political issue. And the and it's a science issue. And those things are incredibly mixed, except in our classrooms. So I think one of the things that we have to teach students is how to talk together across disciplines and how to be able to think, how is this connected to this? How is this connected to this? And more classes that mix things up entirely so that physicists and English teachers are talking together, um, to me feel like a value added that comes from college that really can't come from any place else in the world until you're in that world and living in that world and having to deal with it. Um, we can be arming people for the world in a very powerful way if we give up the silos or the turf that so much define our, pra our, our faculty lives and our practical lives as faculty members. Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, 
in, in her question, Kate uh, emphasized interdisciplinarians. I think it's worth just echoing the world is interdisciplinarian. Um, thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you both for, for really, really sweet answers. As a humanist myself, I, I, I really admire both the question and the answers. Um, we have a, a different, and again, friends, you can see how easy this is to submit questions. Um, and you can see how generously and extensively both our guests uh, respond to them. So please throw in more questions for us. Um, we have one from uh, Kiel Dunsch uh, who asks, in my view, the single biggest threat to higher ed sustainability is the loss of its credential monopoly with its degrees. I would like Catherine Christina's take on alternative credentialing. So can I, do you mind if I jump in here, Thank Christina? You. Um, I, as some of you know, I'm the co-founder of what NSF calls the world's first and oldest academic so social network. Um, the it, we call it Haystack, but the initials are H-A-S-T-A-C, Humanities, Arts, Science, Technology Alliance and Collaboratory. I recently was telling somebody about how we wanted to have this thing called a wiki in 2002. And so we talked to this guy in a garage. And we worked on the first wiki, and then the next year he launched Wikipedia. It was Jimmy Wales. I hadn't even really thought wow. about how historic that is. Wow. <laughs> True. Um, you know, so this was, um, but in haste, one of the things we're doing now is we're trying to redesign. This website is way too expensive. We have 18,000 members. It's too expensive for anyone to keep up anymore. So we've been talking to a developer about ways we might be able to archive the current website and, and think about rescaling and what Haystack might look like in the future. Mm -hmm. And as a good developer, she uses design discourse and she asked us about user stories. And in a user story, you ask a formula question. As an authentic user, I should be able to do this action in order to have this benefit. Online credentialing is I should be able to get this online credential in order to get this benefit, which is often an immediate job that uses these skills. Cynically, I'm worried that Google and Amazon are pro promoting that kind of credentialing because they want you to have that kind of um, training, their training, for those kinds of skills, beginning level, undergraduate, under paid, under resourced skills that we know have an incredibly low glass ceiling. The glass ceiling for programmers programmers about five years. If you don't also have all those essential skills, all those connector skills, all those bigger ways of thinking, all of those cultural ways of thinking, you're not going to get above that glass, glass ceiling. You're going to be credentialed for superannuation, credentialed mm -hmm. for, op, for quick obsolescence in the most cynical terms possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very suspicious. And as you know, I've been doing badging and alternative credentialing in my classrooms, mm -hmm. in competitions with my life as a member of the Mozilla board for 20 years. I believe in it. I do not believe in that as a substitute for education, especially for people who do not come from middle class backgrounds. Um, people who talk about uh, the privileged poor, first generation college students who go into college talk about the hidden curriculum. All the things that middle class people learn at the dinner table, um, that people whose fathers have never worn a tie except at a funeral or a wedding, uh -huh. don't have as a matter of currency because they're things that are about the passport to, I didn't do well on that. my SATs, we'll get you a tutor, right? No, my students live on $7,000 a year. There's no tutor. Tutor costs $7,000 a year. Uh -huh. What are the hidden curriculums of college that you learn by being in college with diverse people that will allow you to move beyond the glass ceiling of your first five or six years in a job. Uh, I have a friend who's a therapist who said almost all of her clients are 40 year old people who've gotten to the glass ceiling and don't know what to do next. Um, who thought they're often, um, she herself is Asian American and her students are often Asian American who are looking towards a specific job to getting a job right out of college and now have gotten to the glass ceiling that's often gendered, racial and class bound as well as field bound and they don't know what the next step is. Um, those are things, those should be part of our user story in college, that you're not just learning content, you're learning skills that will allow you to be leaders, future leaders of change in the world and future le leaders in your workplace. And that's typically reserved for the very elite, those roles. And we got lots of research on that, lots of research on that. Uh, that that's a that's a fantastic answer um and uh, i know keel a bit and, and I, I i suspect and he'll jump in i think and, and what he would say is so are you saying that universities like uni and the four thousand plus others in the u.s and the twenty thousand in the world uh should they then maintain their position as not just teaching classes but also issuing credentials and 
I mean, CUNY does. CUNY has a lot. I mean, nursing degrees, um, physician's assistants, um, optometrists, audiology. There are many, many kinds of certification you get. And you're doing a four-year college education as well. And many of our students are coming back and retraining in fields and getting certification and retraining. And then many of them also will also be getting degrees at the same time. And I think that's a, a model that's an important model for the future. So that you're getting both and. Also, if you're being credentialed in an atmosphere where there constantly are events going on, constantly mm -hmm. performances, talks, mm -hmm. experiments, exhibits, you're not, you're getting a different kind of education. You're getting many of the advantages of an education that don't come with a simple credentialing service and skills, literal skills building credentialing service. And again, I've spent my whole last 20 years on alternative credentials. I'm not against them. I just know their limits. And I'm very cynical about them when the provider and the end user are the same person. When Google's giving you the education, Google is hiring you and they're not right. necessarily hiring you at market value. That's a kind of company town idea. Yep. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you. Kiel, thank you for a great question. Great and question. Kiel, thank you. Thank you for a rich, rich answer. Um, uh, we have a video question. Uh, I want to bring up a, a great friend of the program and put us all in a special mode so we look extra cool for this. Because uh, this is George Station coming to us from Cal State Monterey Bay, uh, long-term friend of the program. And just Hi, George. Hello, George. Are you on vacation? Uh, I am. I am in fact on vacation and uh, tuning in uh, just for this. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that is so kind, George. It's great to so, see you. Okay, great. So uh, basically, uh, you two have said so much already. Uh, I don't know where to go with it. But um, I, I do want to actually uh, look forward to uh, Kathy and uh, Christina, not only the new book, but Kathy, the next edition of New Education. Thank you. Because that's the last time I think I saw you at UC Santa Cruz with Jody Green. Is that's what I was like remembering now. too, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but um, um, I want to just ask more about um, equity issues um, because uh, let me quote, and I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Uh, Australian educator uh, Kate Bowles said, the pandemic has also taught us that all sorts of fixed fittings turned out to be movable. Scheduling, assessment modes, grades, logistics of scale. We're now somewhat free not to put them back as they were. So I'm thinking about you know, not post pandemic, but you know, what we're going into immediately and everything you've said today about meritocracy, hidden curriculum, um, us as, you know, faculty being ready to go back. Can we really do hybrid? Well, all of those things. Um, and I'm, uh, concerned that, um, this next year is going to be about as rough as last year. And I'm wondering how we can get through this, keeping issues of equity in mind. Um, and maybe if you could uh, even be specific, if you want to get back to your book, are there issues as far as um, racial and ethnic equity in, in addition to uh, the sort of a little more broad first generation students and, so, and other challenges that you were talking about with hidden curriculum? So maybe if we can start with that. I, so much is so huge, but that's probably enough to if, if i could get a response from both of you that's a good start <laughs> <laughs> easy question george thank hey. you <laughs> it's ball. It's that, ball. that was the low ball version so <laughs> um do you want to start christina or do you want me to jump in um i can kind of um stitch a few of the questions together and then kathy will take it away um I just want to come back to again the value of the humanities and the importance of learning how to tell a story and how to tell a compelling story, right? And I think that that is a skill that every student needs. And like Kathy was saying, middle class family, you know, like trained in telling a compelling story, trained in telling, you know, showing the value of work and not necessarily in the ways that all um, students are trained in like the unspoken things that you have to come to college knowing to crack the code and to, you know, a lot of students don't even know about the support available or think you have to be in really big trouble to right. go get that support, you know. And it's so 
crucial that we as faculty, as administrators, as staff, tell these stories to try to make this change, these changes in education that we're talking about. And, and I think that that is an asset of the humanities and the importance that the humanities plays in that role of shifting the needle um, to meet the needs of more students. And I think the more that story, like, let's stop telling the story of the privileged upper, you know, upper class white kid who goes to the Ivies, who's in the 0.4% of undergraduates in the US. Let's not make that the story of every college student and think about the stories of students who are working part time, who didn't come in knowing, you know, having the insider knowledge that I think a lot of us who have decided to devote our lives to academia have. Um, and so that's, I think the importance of telling stories, that's the realm of the humanities. Um, and it's the realm of every d discipline, every student, you know, you can't get the grant if you don't know how to tell a compelling story. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the stories that we know, and this has been well backed by research, is students who are first generation think if they go to a counselor or an advisor or a tutor, that means they've failed. Whereas rich kids feel like that means that wow. people are working for them and supporting them. Yeah. So it's a very, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a the disp disparate um, idea of what is a resource versus what is my privilege? Hey, I've earned this, right? My, I don't know any CUNY student who feels that they're sort of entitled um, to the things that that um, elite students feel that they're entitled, that they're entitled, have been taught that they're entitled for. That's what you're paying your tuition for. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about faculty too, George. I think this is a really crucial thing. In the new version of the new education, I talk about ten things we need to do um, to change our institutions. The first one is change the faculty reward system, because in a system of share, shared governance. Change can't just work from top down, can't just work from bottom up, but no faculty member who's smart is going to give up their chance for promotion and reward if it means they're going to be penalized for it. And right now we have a system where a monograph or a citations in, a, in an article are really all that count. And institutional service, which is institutional change, institutional leadership, barely counts at all until you're an official administrator. So you're actually asking people to sacrifice their careers to change their institutions. Who does that? Um, the second rule I have is get rid of the diversity tax. If 45% of our students are students of color and 25% of our faculty are, and if your college handbook has a person of color in every darn photo and, on every, and you have a person of color on every committee, and you don't have faculty representation, you're ruining people's lives and careers. Yeah. You are setting up a structure of inequality supposedly to become more equitable. That's a terrible model for the teacher. It's a terrible model for student. It's a terrible model for society. It's called exploitation plus. Um, so that's one of my other things. As we come back, all of those things ex increase exponentially. So for example, the burdens are falling more on faculty of color. The hardship is falling harder on students of color. Um, there are inequity issues on every level. Um, and I think those have to be addressed institutionally. And I hope our administrators are listening. I don't know if you're listening, yeah. by the way. My voice just broke up yeah. terribly. No, you sound, oh, good. Well, you sound good. It was okay? We're listening. <laughs> and and um, I'm going to be uh, uh, pointing uh, a few people on my campus to this recording. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, um, so based on what you just said, um, we've had a lot of statements over uh, last year, continuing this year, all over university and college websites everywhere. Last Wait. summer, it was about the unrest and George Floyd's killing. Um, this summer, it was about the Chauvin con conviction and so on. But they're all of a type as far as all those campus statements, those promises of what we are going to do that are kind of echoed in what you're talking about. Um, I'm wondering if you have any evidence that universities are actually going to do what they have been saying they should be doing on all the, in all those wonderful statements, most of which are still on the web for us to read uh, from last year and continuing into this year as far as, um, um, let's get real specific, we haven't so far, black Latino students and so on. Uh, you know, 
and if you've addressed this in your book, if you have anything to say about that, um, I, I, I hear it. I hear in but. the in what you've said so far, but please embellish a little for us. Sure. And, and 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 thank you so much, Brian, for welcoming me up uh, to uh, ask this today. Well, thank you, and uh, my best to your wife. Uh, I hope she forgives you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a separate uh, negotiation. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> so, um, I would say two things at once. There's been lots of hiring, um, and lots of hiring, um, not just in academe, but in museum directors, museum curators, library people in, in places of prominence. I, my fear, and this is not just my fear, but my fear of talking to lots of older scholars of color and uh, museum directors of color who are worried that young people are being put in positions of responsibility without resources and support for those responsibilities and are going to be taking the fall, especially as at the same time we have those statements on websites, we have Florida, the governor of Florida, signing a law saying that every student and every faculty member has to say what their political beliefs are and, and their tuition is going, their scholarships are going to be judged by whether they're having true knowledge or this thing that people are making up called critical race theory. Um, they don't mean Kimberly Crenshaw and 1970s legal theory. They mean some other thing that's being used like communism was used by McCarthyism and for the exact same end. So we have two things happening at once in society and on websites and in the, the reality of people coming into those, uh, both being hired in positions, I hope, with support, I hope everybody who's being hired into those positions has a great mentor who's helping them get all the resources they need to su succeed and thrive and, and change the world. More cynically, I'm afraid that too many people are being hired uh, in positions of visible, I'm saying this very carefully, uh -huh. visible prominence without the kind of infrastructural support that is, is normally given to people in leadership roles. And that is what we all have to fight against and be dedicated to and be looking at very carefully. Because otherwise there's gonna be a lot of scapegoating of exactly the people who should be the next generation of our great leaders in, in academe. Uh -huh. so that's, I hope that didn't sound too depressing and cynical, but it's my, my commitment this year is, is in that direction as much as in any direction right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And again, George, thank you for the really powerful question. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We'll, um, I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, of time and we have some questions stacked up and I want to make sure that we get a chance to address all of them. Friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So you have a chance if you'd like to click the raised hand button and join us. But in the meantime, we have more questions in educational change. Uh, and one of them comes from Jason Frank at Santa Fe. A very pointed question. How can higher ed effectively address issues like equity, social justice, and student trauma while continuing to rely so heavily on an adjunctified work? Go so, for it, Christina. <laughs> a lot of capital B, big capital F feelings about this. Um, <laughs> so um, kind of piggybacking on what Kathy was saying, you know, there were a lot, we saw a lot of cluster hires um, of people of color. Um, and I think that um, one thing that is really hard that I think we need to fight against is the requirement of a certain number of citations and that being what tenure depends on and the um the unspoken requirements of mentoring all of these people right and i think coming from the adjunctified workforce mentorship is so much of what we do and it goes so far beyond whether you are, you know, tenure track or not. I think mentoring is such an important part of education and it's not valued in our tenure and promotion structures. And I think what Kathy was saying earlier about the importance of, it's not service, um, coming back to the language issue, right? Not soft skills, but essential skills or core skills. It's not service, it's leadership, right? But this is, affecting change across the university. Every time you volunteer to be on a committee, um, and even as an adjunct, I've participated on committees completely uncompensated. Um, every time you spend extra hours on 
teacher training and professional development but goes uncompensated, unaccounted for, not doesn't count toward tenure or promotion. Those things, like we really need to build our reward systems, rebuild them on accounting for leadership as much as we do research, if not more so, um, as much as we do, we should count teaching. Um, those are all connected. They're all related to one another. And it goes back again to the siloing problem right, um, that teaching and research are often coincide. And I'm in English, I've taught many composition courses, and I actually had a faculty member observe me um, teaching a course of 35 students over enrolled. And she said, you can't keep doing that, You're, you'll get burned out. And I said, so what do you teach? And she teaches honors senior poetry with maybe 13 or less student, or fewer uh -huh. students. Uh -huh. And I was like, so that's a demonstrable difference. And also for me to make a living as a PhD student at the time, um, living in New York City, I was not only working, um, teaching on multiple campuses, moonlighting at a different school, um, working on a dissertation supposedly, um, working as a fellow, um, and also working in, a, in as student, um, staff in the um, admissions office. Wow. And fortunately at CUNY, CUNY, we couldn't keep the lights on without student labor. Um, no university could. No, yeah. no university could. And I think that's amazing in that I've now graduated with this tremendous skill set. But um, again, I think we need to think about service as leadership and how to structure our reward system in those ways to value good teaching as much as we do research and value good leadership as much as we do research. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your own story. And I, my admiration from you just escalated. Um, I didn't know that there were actually three or four of you, Christina. I thought there were <laughs> two. That's I think a there's a hundred. <laughs> well, and the problem is that students suffer, right? That then they're coming to me asking for recommendation letters when they apply for jobs or fellowships or study abroad mm -hmm. or, or graduate school. And I'm like, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. My recommendation does not mean much, but I'm the only person who knows your name. And so how can I mentor you better to seek out and find mentors who can write that letter for you? Thank you for sharing that. And and Jason, thank you for the, the very pointed and very apt question. I think that's a contradiction that we're not really facing very hard um, or very clearly. Um, we have uh, more questions that have come in. One from Michael uh, Verdusco, University of Detroit Mercy. Uh, and Michael asks, higher education is getting dismissed, devalued, or targeted for reform. Do you have suggestions for institutions to communicate the value of an education, of a liberal arts education? Uh, it, it, unfortunately, the exact things that we're communicating as the value of higher education is the things that people want us to stop doing. So I think actually, rather than communicating the value of higher education, we need to be one, standing our ground about why it's important. But two, I think we have to go on the offensive. I think the conversation about critical race theory has become entirely um, uh, dominated uh, by um, people who are saying we're doing some terrible thing, thwarting, uh, denying history. Um, the governor of Texas that spoke out against critical race theory. Also, it was only in 2018 that the Texas legislature voted to put slavery in as a cause of the Civil War. The required high school textbooks in the, city, in the state of Texas said the two causes of the main cause of the Civil War were states' rights and... Um, something else but it had nothing to do with sla slave with slavery um, and there was a resolution passed that slavery be put into the textbooks that was 2018 2018 and now the same legislature is saying they have to outlaw critical race theory we haven't even gotten history forget it we don't have real honest accurate history i don't even want to talk about critical race theory i mean because nobody even it's a made-up term it's like communism with mccarthyism and it's being used so we have to say passionately that we stand for accurate, reliable, powerful ways of understanding what all of our fields are, including science. 
I mean, look at the world's misinformation about science and the, again, the overbalance given to anti-vaxxers and people who are refuting the power of, of um, um, science at this, uh, versus people who are standing up for science. It's a, you know, I think we have to say just what our message is and what, what we're doing undefensively, literally undefensively. I think we have to be as offensive as we can be right now to get our message out there. Um, I'm, powerfully, I'm, powerfully. I'm happy to help be offensive. Let, let me <laughs> um, thank you. I'm counting uh, on you, Brian. <laughs> uh, I'm, well, for, well, first of all, Michael, thank you for, the, for that question. question. And, um, and uh, all best to you in Detroit. Uh, you guys have gone through a horrible time this past year. Uh, and and Kathy, uh, in in support of what you're saying, Mike Ricci in chat says, um, adjunctification is a side effect of anti-intellectualism. Yes, and that's the reason why politicians cut public support for higher ed. Um, and then uh, we had a, a great response, um, uh, Christina, to your point from Nikki uh, Joanne, who says, uh, "What example are we setting for students if we harm ourselves in the process of existing in the academy?" Absolutely. Yeah, I think in the new education, I say that students are learning from adjunct exploited labor, how to be adjunct exploited workers themselves. Because what we see in higher education is hardly limited to higher education. It's true of lawyers, accountants. I mean, the outsourcing, the gig economy is happening ev everywhere, uh, yes. including in higher education. Higher education, only two states have returned to two, pre-2008, 2008 funding levels. Yeah, we still um, so we're we're talking about um, a process that isn't happened willfully. It's happened decisively and as a political issue um, w that contributes to the not only adjunctification, which is exploiting new faculty, but also ten percent of um, actual uh, of full time faculty have also been cut out, which is also exploitation of every level of workers at the university, including students. It's a it's it's a, it's a robbery. Robbing, we're robbing the future, future students, future teachers, everybody's future. Um, I, I don't want to end on 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 such a uh, such a grim note, but I do want to end with that passion and that concern. Um, and uh, we are at the end of the hour somehow. Um, I thought we just started, and um, and you guys are fantastic. Um, let me let me thank both of you, Christine and Kathy, for just terrific, terrific answers. This has been like a, a master class in thinking about higher education reform and reimagination. What are what are the best ways to keep up with each of you? Uh, Kathy, you're, you're pretty active on Twitter. <laughs> you follow me on Twitter and you're going to hear me shooting off my mouth about things every single day. Very good. Uh, that's a great way to keep up with me. Okay. Okay. And uh, and Christina, what's the best way to keep up with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm also on Twitter. Um, you can find me there. And I also blog about teaching um, on uh, Haystack. We have a mm -hmm. pedagogy uh -huh. group where we blog frequently about teaching. Very good. I know we'll have a lot to say about hybrid teaching in the coming semester. Excellent, excellent. And we should both look at the uh, Harvard University Press catalog uh, for when uh, they announce your new book. Thank you. And Brian, thank you for all you do. I mean, I think one of the ways that we keep our spirits up are programs like yours, and you do such a great job week after week after week. Thank you. Oh, thank you for saying that. That's that's off the kind. Um, that leaves out a, a hidden third term that I want to reveal now, which is I want to thank the entire crew of everybody and what used to be called the audience. Thank you for these terrific questions in the chat box. We've been lighting it up. Um, thank you. Thank you all. But don't go yet. Don't go yet, because I need to point out where we're headed for the next uh, few weeks. Just to remind you that uh, the next few sessions, we're going to be looking back at racial equity, at mentoring, trauma-informed teaching, personalized learning, and augmented and virtual reality. We're also, if you'd like to go back and keep talking about all these issues, just use the hashtag FTTE uh, on Twitter. And we already had some back and forth just now or the past hour. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past and look at our archives, including Kathy's previous event, uh, appearance, our sessions on everything that's come up so far, from adjunctification to uh, in changing teaching to questions of work-life balance, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can see a lot more. Um, in the chat, uh, Danette Long asked, what's the title of their new book? Danette, the title was provisional yet. They haven't fully agreed upon it yet, so it's going to be there, and I'll share it out when it comes out. 
Uh, in the meantime, let me thank everybody again for a very impassioned, thoughtful, and very, very rich conversation. This is the best way, I think, for us to think about where higher education is going next and the best way for us to start redesigning it. Uh, in the meantime, everybody, we'll see you online next time. Take care, be safe, and we'll talk to you next Thursday. Bye-bye.